us have heard about the miracles Jesus performed. Maybe we know about the lessons he taught others. But what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg not only tackles that question, but he looks at what the apostles believed in a message titled, Not One Jot or Tittle. I invite you to turn with me to the two passages of Scripture, just brief passages that are part of uh, the basis for my assigned subject this evening. We're going to read uh, just from Matthew and chapter 5, the words of Jesus, Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a jot or a tittle or an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then in the words of Paul, when he writes to Timothy in chapter 3, As for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Just a brief prayer. Spirit of God, descend upon our hearts. Wean them from earth through all their pulses move. Speak to our weakness, mighty as Thou art, and make us love Thee as we ought to love. For Jesus' sake, amen. On the 2nd of June, 1953—I can't say I remember it well—in the context of the coronation of Elizabeth II, Her Majesty was presented with a Bible, and in the presentation these words. Our gracious Queen, to keep Your Majesty ever mindful of the law and gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. And with those words, she ascended the throne. Some 2,000 years preceding that, not in an abbey, but on a mountainside, Jesus the King declared, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, in taking such a vast subject in a relatively short time, I want to pose three straightforward questions. First of all, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Secondly, what did the apostles believe about the Bible? And thirdly, what do you and I believe about the Bible? So first of all, then, Jesus. In those words there, on that mountainside, he provides us with a very straightforward and clear statement of his own view of Scripture. He says that the Old Testament is absolutely trustworthy, even down to the smallest detail. Now, it is one thing for someone to make a declaration like that, and then it is another for us to be able to walk with that person and see that kind of conviction borne out in everyday life. And while it would be tedious to weave our way through all of the Gospels, at least we could stop for a moment in a number of places and see just what Jesus believed about the Bible when He is tempted in the wilderness by the evil one. He refutes the temptations of the devil by using the Scriptures. Man will not live by bread alone, he says, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He knew that the words of the proverb were absolutely true. 
every word of God proves true. And so when he is confronted, his immediate resource is to the Word of God itself. If we were to go with him back to his childhood home and uh, sit there in that amazing uh, encounter that took place in the synagogue in Nazareth, we would have found ourselves like the rest of the congregation on the very edge of our seats when after he had read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he sat down in the position of the teacher. And uh, Luke records for us in chapter 4 that all the eyes of the people in the synagogue were fastened on him. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? There wasn't a, there wasn't a wandering gaze. What is going to come now from his lips? And what does Jesus do? Well, he says to them dramatically, today this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, all of the Old Testament promises of what God was going to do now resided in him. And then as the New Testament unfolded, with the fulfillment of all that God has done, the focus remained on him. In the upper room, by way of explanation, when the question is unfolding about uh, where he is going next and what will happen to him and why these things are happening to him. Jesus doesn't conjure something up, as it were. Again, the gospel writers remind us, Jesus says to the group, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. In other words, the Lord Jesus himself used his Bible to decipher the providences of God in his own life. The Lord Jesus used his Bible in order to grant him assurance in the face of all that was yet before him. No surprise, then, that he had spoken so clearly on the mountainside. And what about on the roadside? when after the resurrection we have that amazing encounter uh, with those two characters, Cleopas and the person who is known as the other disciple. What a shame. You get in the Bible and you don't even get your name. And some of us are going to have a terrific time just going through in the new heaven and the new earth saying, I'm looking for somebody. I'm looking for the other disciple. Does anyone know who, who that is? And somebody says it's his wife, and I don't know who it is. If we were supposed to know, we would have been told. It's there, perhaps, to remind us that most of us don't have our names, you see. Most of us are the other disciples. Most impact in life's lived may be viewed in unvisited graves, unvisited tombstones. Well, actually, that's George Eliot in Middlemarch, isn't it? I just stole that. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Most of you didn't recognize it. But anyway, there he was. There he was. You see, a good Scottish education does wonders for you. But on the, on the roadside, what does he do? What, what's, what's the conversation he says to them? Well, there's been a huge hullabaloo in Jerusalem. Really? Yes. Well, it's all been about Jesus of Nazareth. He, past tense, was a prophet, and we, past tense, had hoped that he was actually going to be the one for whom we had been looking when we were reading our Bibles in anticipation of the appearing of the one who had come. And we've heard rumors about somehow or another he's around, but there's been no sign of him at all. And surely it is of great significance that Jesus does not just go like Shazam! It's me! What does he do? He returns to the Bible, and he provides them with probably the finest Bible study that we don't actually have the text for in all of the New Testament. And when the penny dropped for these characters, they didn't say, you know, I wish we'd had a phone because we could have taken a selfie with them, you know. Or, or they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't want to immediately be, be preoccupied even with the encounter itself. No, they rejoiced in the exposition of the Scriptures. 
And when, in a relatively short order of time, he is now present again with his disciples, what does he say to them? He says, these are my words, and everything written about me in this book. And then he goes on, and Luke says, and he opened their minds in order that they might understand the Scriptures. What was Jesus doing? Well, he was preparing them, preparing them because they were going to take the gospel to the world. He received the words that he spoke from the Father. He gave those words to the apostles, and their words in turn became the content of the New Testament. Jesus endorsed the authority of the Old Testament, and then he in turn made provision for the New Testament by authorizing his apostles in the task to which they were called. And in actual fact, in writing the New Testament, the apostles were actually making it possible for them to do what Jesus had asked them to do. In writing the New Testament, they were making it possible for them, in and through the Scriptures, to go to the end of the earth and to continue to the end of the age. How could they possibly go to the end of the earth? How could they continue to the end of the age? How is that happening? Through the Scriptures. The confidence of heaven resides in the Scriptures. And surely, no follower of Jesus could possibly have a less view of Scripture than Jesus himself. What did Jesus believe? Well, this is what he believed. What did the apostles believe? Well, what is it that Peter says in his second letter there? Men spake from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And come back to that. Or in the verses that we read here from 2 Timothy in chapter 3, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, as we came in here today, we passed a number of uh, galleries and museums filled with all kinds of splendid things that are, for most of us, utterly inspiring. In other words, for us to view them or read them or enjoy them is to be aware of the effect that it has upon us. So we refer to it that it, as being inspiring. But when the Bible uses this verb in this way, it's not to speak about the impact that the Scriptures have on us, but it is to remind us that the source of the Scriptures is in God alone. Now, when Paul gives us this, and we know this is probably the classic passage on the doctrine of Scripture's inspiration and so on, I don't think that we should imagine that Timothy when he read this letter, said, oh, wow, there's, there's a novel thought. All Scripture is inspired by God, as if Paul was telling him something that he didn't know. Timothy knew the Scriptures. He'd known them from infancy. He had been brought up in the Old Testament. He was familiar with the fact that this is God's Word. This is how God has spoken. And now Timothy is about to take on the responsibility that falls to him as a result of the departure of of Saul, Paul. Uh, the time in which he is engaged is not the easiest of times. In fact, it's frankly difficult. And it is made all the more daunting by the fact of Paul's departure. Because we need one another, don't we? And those of us who have those to whom we look, which I trust is all of us, do not like the thought of them not being there even if they're not immediately at arm's length, at access for a call or a query, a concern. And for that to be severed in time is a significant issue. And when we read the Bible and we read of these individuals, we ought not to forget the humanity of it all, that Paul loved Timothy. Timothy owed his spiritual life to Paul. They were affectionate and engaged with one another in the cause of the gospel. And now he says, the time has come, Timothy, for my analysis. I'm about to hang up my boots. 
You know the environment in which you're ministering. You know, Timothy, how absolutely essential it is that you do not drop the ball in this instance. And let me remind you, all the Scripture is breathed out by God. So, in other words, the very foundation of that to which he calls him is grounded in the Scriptures themselves. So that although he will no longer have access to Paul, he can be assured that the Scripture is utterly reliable, that it is divinely inspired, that it is entirely sufficient for the fulfilling of his ministry. Now, why was that so crucial, and why is it so crucial? Well, I've alluded to it already. If Timothy were to lose confidence in the truth, in the power, in the relevance of Scripture, then there would be nothing for him to pass to faithful men, to Timothy 2, who would then in turn be enabled to teach others also. If he were to lose confidence in this, then there would be nobody who would be complete and equipped, because the equipping and the completion and the fulfillment of these things is grounded in the Scriptures themselves. Now, although it took time for the New Testament to finally be recognized and finalized somewhere around the end of the fourth century, we need to realize, too, that you don't have to ferret around in your Bible to realize that even early on, the picture of the authoritative elements of the New Testament are quickly becoming apparent. Even in 1 Timothy, for example, when Paul is writing there, and he quotes a saying of Jesus at the the same time as he's quoting from the Old Testament, and he refers to them both as Scriptures. Uh, Peter, in the same way, refers to the letters of Paul and referring to them as Scripture. And in all of this, the point of it, as we see in the text, is that the message of the Bible in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ritterboss puts it quite wonderfully in just a sentence when he says, God did not inspire the Bible to give us a holy book. But in order to bring us into fellowship with Him, in order to give us Christ, to give us Christ, you know, it's distinctly possible to be very excited about the Bible and miss Jesus in the process. Did you have a CSSM chorus book, any of you, when you grew up? You remember you used to sing that at the Bible class? Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me. In other words, illuminate the printed page. This is not asking for inspiration. This is asking for illumination in the chorus, at least if I understand it correctly. And so we need to realize this and remind ourselves of it. And the wonder of it, of course, and the mystery of it is often a preoccupation, understanding that in doing this, God didn't dictate the Bible, as it were, or type it out or put it on a laptop, and somehow using individuals as if they were uh, put into neutral in the process. They didn't know what was going on. Well, you, you understand this. I needn't spend a long time on it. The Bible is not an object into which God breathed something. It is something which God Himself breathed out. And so, that picture of being swept along and moved by the Holy Spirit is simply what we understand as concurrence or the dual authorship of Scripture, that in the process of giving to us the Bible, whether it is in the book of Amos or whether it is the gospel of Luke or whatever it may be, God is 100% involved in breathing out. And the writer, the human author, is 100% involved in writing it down. That is why, as has been pointed out for us, while it is the one gospel, the distinctive elements have to do with the distinctive personalities. And when you read Ezekiel, it does read just a wee bit different from Isaiah as well. They were all individuals. Says Calvin, 
the Scriptures obtain full authority among believers only when men regard them as having sprung from heaven, as if there the living words of God were heard. You take the way we come to the average church. Do you actually believe that the Bible is the tiller that guards and guides the church? That's why it's a wonderful thing. When you go into a church building and somebody stands up and says, let us hear the Word of God, so that we might be like the Thessalonians. And Paul writes to them and says, I love you folks. When you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, a divine product produced through the instrumentality of humanity. God spoke without violating the personality of the authors, and the men wrote without di distorting the divine message that they conveyed. Now, what Paul is doing in speaking to Timothy here in his apostolic uh, framework is making sure that when Timothy exercises his ministry, he's going to be absolutely convinced of this. And it is on account of that that he's already issued a clear call to him to continue in what he has learned, to continue in what he has firmly believed. But you see the imperative nature of what is happening. I think it was Donald Guthrie who taught me in LBC New Testament. I think he's the one who said, from a human perspective, the church at this point, from Paul to Timothy, trembled, humanly speaking, on the brink of annihilation. There was no guarantee that it was going to make the transition from the apostolic to the post-apostolic church. That's the importance of the Scriptures. That's the importance of what Paul is saying. The passing of the spiritual baton from Paul to Timothy is a great example of partnership in gospel ministry. It's one part of our message titled, Not One Jot or Tittle, on Truth for Life with Alistair Begg. Throughout the New Testament, we read about the church working together as the body of Christ. That's what Truth for Life is all about. Together, as believers, we form one body commissioned by Jesus to go into the entire world and to share the gospel. It's humbling for us to partner with you, to serve with you side by side in this extraordinary calling. Our team at Truth for Life is upheld by the financial support you provide, and it's only together as one body that we can fulfill the Lord's instruction to proclaim the gospel through Truth for Life. As we come to the close of 2020 in a couple of days, we're asking you to make a much-needed donation so we can end the year solidly and embrace the coming year with the funds we need to be able to move forward. When you make a year-end gift, we want to invite you to request a book that will provide fresh focus for your family in the new year. This is a one-year devotional that begins in Genesis, takes us all the way through to Revelation. It's titled Exploring the Bible Together. The book is interactive, and it helps parents and children view the Bible as a treasure that is waiting to be discovered. It also helps you as a parent because it simplifies the organization of family devotions by breaking the 52-week plan into manageable lessons. The daily entries include scripture reading, discussion questions, a key spiritual lesson, and then there's a closing prayer. Request your copy of the book when you give by tapping the image you see on the mobile app or give online at truthforlife.org or you can call us to donate 888-588-7884. I'm Bob Lapine. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to listen tomorrow for the conclusion of the message titled, Not One Jot or Tittle, as we examine what we believe about God's Word. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.